to the 24th chapter of the book of Genesis. The high and holy calling. I'm going to start out with the fountainhead of this high and holy calling. You know the fountainhead of the human race was Adam. The fountainhead of the Christian race is Abraham. There was another fountainhead at one time in history because man had become rebellious against God and their heart was only full of evil continually and God destroyed everybody but eight persons and Noah and his family were left and Noah became the fountainhead of a new generation upon this earth. But that was a natural generation. Then God raised up Abraham after Noah's day several hundred years later and Abraham became the fountainhead of a new spiritual generation that brought Jesus into the world and brought us into the family of God through Jesus Christ, the greatest descendant of Abraham, and he had some great ones. David, a man after his own heart, was a descendant of Abraham. And the scripture says that we that <clears throat> walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, that we're Abraham's children and his seed. Likewise. I'm going to just briefly here share with you this story of how this great generation started. Abram was old. Did I tell you Genesis 24? Genesis the 24th chapter. Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. That servant's name was Eliezer. Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. Separation. Was it evidence from Genesis, the 12th chapter? through the remaining chapters of the Word of God. There's only 11 chapters in the first part of your Holy Bible that does not indicate complete separation from the world. Abraham was the first in the fountainhead of those that would separate themselves to that high and that holy calling that God has called us into. A high calling, a holy calling, and a heavenly calling. The Bible calls it, I'll hold you place here, I'll just refer to this briefly. <clears throat> In 2 Timothy 1, Paul said we're called to a high calling. In Philippians, or I beg your pardon, Philippians 3.14, he called us into a high calling. In 2 Timothy 1 and 9, he said God called us unto a holy calling. In Hebrews 3 and 1, he said, Brethren, we're partakers of the heavenly calling. How did we come about this calling? Because the fountainhead of our walk of faith was Abraham, and he was faithful to God, and his descendants that walk in that faith can have the same faith and the same blessing of Abraham right now in this present day. And we're, have been, we've been called to that holy calling. I've got to remind you, Hebrew, or rather Romans 11, 29 says, For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. When God's called you into this high and holy and heavenly calling, and you've received it, and then your faint heart turns you away from it, you're going to be lost when you turn away. You can't make it. You've got to stay and walk in that calling. And then old brother Peter just to nail it down a little more assurance and uh, with resolution he said in 2 Timothy or 2 Peter 1 and 10 he said brethren make your calling and election sure election that means selection God selected you in power and he put his hand on you and he took you by the hand and led you into this high holy and heavenly calling and he says be sure to make your calling and election sure 
And then those things, from the third verse to the, through the ninth verses, he tells us how to do it. He said, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. And the next verse says, and so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To get into that kingdom, when we've been called with a high and holy and heavenly calling as we have received from the Lord, and we sit here today in the house of God, Beth El, and his old Jacob found out in his experience when he was fleeing from his brother later on a descendant, he was the third generation from Abraham. It was Abraham, his son Isaac, and then Jacob. And Jacob, he prayed all night. And he saw a ladder reaching to heaven out in the wilderness. But that later became one of the great cities in Israel called Bethel, or Beth El, the house of God. But there wasn't no city there. There wasn't no house there at that time. But Jacob prayed that night. And he saw that ladder reaching to heaven, the angels of God ascending and descending. And the Lord standing up at the top of that ladder and said, Jacob, I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to make of thee and your descendants a great nation. And I'll bless thee if you'll pay your tithes and be faithful to me. Well, he did. He made that vow to the Lord. And old Jacob said, this is nothing but the house of God. It was named Luz at that time. It was a little old place named El U C, Light. But when he got through with that experience, he changed the name of that little burg to Beth El. He said, this is nothing other than the house of God, and it's the gate of heaven. <laughs> Praise God. Woo! You got to be a descendant of Abraham to have a house of God. That's the gate of heaven. As Paul said, the house of God is a house of prayer, and it's the pillar and the ground of the truth. Praise God. All right, if you got that high and holy calling, that's where you belong. In Bethel, the gate of heaven. In a church. In a sanctuary. That is the pillar and ground of the truth. That is a house of prayer. Praise God. And that's the only place, every church is not the gate of heaven. Every church is not Bethel, the house of God. It's just an old house. But here now, going back to Brother Abraham now, we've got this set apart here for your meditation on the high and holy calling, the heavenly calling, it all began with Abraham. That's where it started. I love to talk about Abraham. I love to read about Abraham. I love to lay in bed at night and meditate upon Abraham because he's my daddy. He's the father of the faithful. Praise God. He's the father of everybody. And I'll show you that from the Bible. Jesus said it. Even though they were kin to Abraham and they were Abraham's seed, he looked at the people in the 8th chapter of the book of John. He said, you're the children of your devil. They said, we're children of Abraham. He said, I know you're Abraham's seed, but if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. You'd live like Abraham. You'd walk in the steps of the faith of your father Abraham. You are your father the devil. He said, I know you are Abraham's seed, but you're not his children. You're not his children. And then Paul over the ninth chapter of Romans said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. The real seed of Abraham is through Isaac, Jacob, David, Jesus, and on down to this present hour. Praise God. Now here is that separation that is really identifiable and it certainly is, is something that's understandable. It's not something we got to imagine and wonder what the Lord means for separation. He spoke to Eliezer, the servant. All of this is typical. It is something that <clears throat> is an epitomization of a greater truth than what is really realized here by this particular experience and historical account of Abraham's act of separating his son that was his descendant of his blessing and his birthright, he was not going to have it if he didn't separate that son from them other people of the world. So 
he said, Eliezer, he's a type of the Holy Ghost. Abraham is a type of God the Father. Isaac's a type of God the Son. And Rebecca is a type of the true bride of Jesus Christ. It's all analyzed. The analogy is all right here. All right, the servant said unto Abraham, and he said, you go back to my country, to my kindred, and take a wife of my son Isaac, and don't you take no wife of my son among these Canaanites. Bunch of idolaters. You get any old gal today, she ain't really a sanctified Christian. You got an idolater. She's got more old jewelry and junk on her body than you can pick a golden calf out of the junk she wants to wear. And then talk about God don't care. No, it's you that don't give a hoot. God cares. I don't care what somebody else thinks. I'm going to care what God cares. And Eliezer, the servant, a type of the Holy Ghost, he's going back to look for that bride. And she's got to be a virgin separated from the idolaters of all of that part of Pat, Pat of Aram, they called it a Padanaram, Mesopotamia, it's called a number of names in the scriptures. And the Holy Ghost, Eliezer the servant, says to Abraham, a type of the father, her adventure the woman I find won't be willing to follow me back. You don't want one. You don't want one like that. Must I needs bring thy son again into the land from whence thou camest? Am I going to take him back to those people you separated me from? My kindred? My father's house? My relatives? Didn't Jesus come along, Abraham's greatest descendant, and say that a man's foes are they of his own family? Am I going to take your son back over there if I can't get a woman, a virgin, that you choose to come back to be his bride and to inherit this land that you've given to all of our ancestors, the land of Palestine or Israel. And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. Don't you take him back where God brought us from. No way. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, See, God separated him from his father's house. I wish Christians could get that through their bone-headed old contrariness or miscalculations or something. I'd like to get to understand what it means to separate yourself from the stupid idolaters around. He said here, the Lord God of heaven which took me from my father's house. See, there was that land was filled with idolatry. But Abraham believed that there was a bride over there that was not an idolater that would be willing to come back and be the bride of his son that was going to receive the, all the inheritance. As you notice later on here, when that servant, Eliezer, with those camels and all those gifts that he brought to give to the family of that bride that would come back, he said, my master has given everything to this son, a son of his old age. See, Sarah had been dead three years. There was no woman in that family except maids. Sarah died, 127 years old, three years before Isaac was 40. Isaac was 37 when his mama died. The Bible said he was lonely. And now he's sending the servant back over there. Her adventure, there is a bride that's not an idolater that'll be willing to separate herself from all that bunch of idolaters and come back over there. They were kin to Abraham. Now those people were God's people, but they did not have the high and holy and heavenly calling upon them. They wouldn't leave that land like Abraham did. See back over in the 12th chapter. Just look at this briefly, what the Lord told him here to start with. Chapter 12. When 
When this thing all started, chapter 12, verse 1, The Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house. Get away from your relatives. They're your worst enemies. And I, <clears throat> unto a land that I will show thee. And there, he says, I'll make of thee a great nation. I'll bless thee. I'll make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee. Bless God, I'm going to bless him. I bless his memory. I bless his works. I bless his life. I bless everything he said and everything he did and everything that all them promises that go with being a, <laughs> a follower of Abraham and walking in those steps of his faith. Praise God, I'm, I want that blessing. And that birthright, I've got that. I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In other words, the possibility is there that every family can be blessed through what Abraham did in separating himself from that idolatry that even was in his father's house. All right. Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. He took up. And here he is, stricken in age. He was old. And God said, now it's time to get a bride for your son. He's your descendant. It's going to be his seed that's going to bring back that high and holy and heavenly calling group together. It's going to be through Isaac. He's got to have a bride. He's got to have a bride that's not an idolater. She's a virgin. And she's willing to get out of that idolatry and separate herself and come over here and walk in the steps of your faith. God, what a job to find a gal like that today. Woo-wee! Verse 7, The Lord of heaven took me out of my, mother's, my father's house from the land of my kindred and Speak unto me, and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall, this is what he says to the servant, Eliezer. He, will, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, thou shalt be clean. <clears throat> From this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. Don't take him back for a brochure. You better listen to this. Some of you is getting your family and your kids on a stinking devilish mess where you take them for entertainment and relaxation and recreation. You better preach your stupid foolishness. Take your children right out here where God delivers you from, from Egypt and all of this stinking old rambling and carrying on. The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning the thing. And he took the camels, the camels of his master, and departed. For all the goods of his master was in his hand. See, he makes a great type of the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Ghost can come down here and do anything that God and Jesus can do. He's the servant. Jesus is not here. He's at the right hand of the Father. God's not here. He's up there on his throne. And Jesus is at the right hand. Who's down here? The servant. Eliezer, as it were. Seeking what? Among you and I, among all the churches, among all the people that claim to be God's people, what's the Holy Ghost doing? Seeking a bride for every true son and daughter of God. Trying to get us ready to be in that bride of Jesus Christ. Getting us purified. Getting us willing to follow Him wherever He leads us and wants us to go. Alright, He made His way to Mesopotamia, verse 10 says, to the city of Nahor. He made His camels kneel down by the, a big well of water. And He got right down on His knees and prayed and said, Oh, God of my master Abraham, said, send that young lady out here that you want to be my master's wife 
and let her come out here and draw water, and I'm going to ask her to give me a drink. He was thirsty. Then if she says, I'll give you a drink and water the camels, I'll know that's the wife, the bride you've chosen for my master's son. Here come Rebecca. What? Before he got through praying, there she was. <laughs> Woo! She come up to him. He said, would you let your pitcher down off your shoulder and give me a drink? He said, sure. I'll give you a drink and I'll draw water and water your camels. God have mercy. He liked to, he liked to blew up. God, he got over by himself and said, Lord, he says, I thank you. This must be the bride. And he says, tell me. He said, who's your father and your family? She said, my daddy is the brother of Abraham. That stayed back. <laughs> oh, Lord. Not more no Eliezer could take. There she was in that same lineage. Same family group that God wanted to get that bride from to deliver her out of the mess of the idolatry of Mesopotamia and bring her back over to be in Abraham's family that she'd walk in that good land that was going to flow with milk and honey for all their descendants. He had to have a pure bride and one that was willing to give up everything and follow in the steps of that faith of Abraham. Them footsteps are in that sand all the way back to Israel. So he, she said, he said to her, is there room in your house for my servants here and I to eat and for provender and a place for my camel's rest? Oh yeah, boy, she took off. She talked to her brother and her daddy. They fixed the house. Great day. Abraham's servants over here. Woo, boy, they made a feast. He come in there, they took care of the camels, they washed their feet and set a meal, and they started to eat. He said, wait a minute, I'm not eating one thing till I tell you what my mission is all about. Now, you ain't going to eat, I ain't going to eat, you hear me out. He said, God has blessed my master Abraham, your kinsman, that left this country years ago and made him great. He's rich in gold and silver and goods and flocks and herds and men servants and maid servants. But said he needs a bride for his son. Said his son is a son of his old age. He didn't have him until he was a hundred years old. And said, he sent me on the journey, made me swear that I would come over here and find in his father's house a bride for his son. Are you willing for Rebecca to go back and be the wife of my master's son? Well, Laban spoke up. Her brother said, call the damsel and let's see what she said. And old Eliezer, no, the asker says, Rebecca, are you willing to go back to that land and, and be the son of uh, be Abraham's son? Why? She said, yes, I'm willing to give. <laughs> Boy, they made ready to go. Her mother and daddy and all of them said, we'll, we'll, we'll stay here 10 days. That's what you folks would do. Oh, you got to hang around them now. Wow, you just got to get around here and hang around your relatives now. Make them happy, you know. They'll be mad at you. <laughs> she, Holy Ghost didn't have no yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, listen here. He said, God answered my prayer. The bride's willing to go in the morning. We're tearing, we're tearing out of here. We're leaving. They looked at Rebecca and said, You willing? Yes, I'm willing. And up on the camel she got. <laughs> That's what the Lord's looking for, that kind of a bride. Not you folks that, oh, my relatives want me to do this. And my relatives want me to do that. And oh, you know, I'm just bound to please my relatives. You're going to get left behind. Them relatives, Jesus said, are your worst enemies. Now, Abraham believed it. And if you're children of the seed of Abraham, then who are you going to believe? Your old baloney? Or what God says through Abraham? I believe Abraham. I got his blessing on my life, and I'm going to have it. The birthright and the blessing, too. Don't you take my son back to where God separated me from them relatives. When 
you're called to a high and holy calling. You belong to the Lord. You don't belong to yourself anymore. And I want to read you here. It's on the back of lesson number three of our Bible correspondence course. The high and holy calling. If God has called you to be really like Jesus in all your spirit, He'll draw you into a life of crucifixion and humility and put on you such demands of obedience that He'll not allow you to follow other Christians. Listen to me! You don't find more things to look at and gaze and stare? Stare at me! God have mercy. I'm preaching my heart out! Many ways he will seem to let other good people to do things which he will not let you do. Other Christians and ministers, they seem to be very religious and useful. They may push themselves, pull wires, work schemes to carry out their plans. But you cannot do it. And if you attempt it, you will meet with such failure and rebuke from the Lord as to make you sorely penitent. Others can brag on themselves, on their work, on their success, on their writings. But the Holy Spirit will not allow you to do any such thing. And if you begin to do it, He will lead you into some deep mortification that will make you despise yourselves, yourself and all your good works. Others will be allowed to succeed in making great sums of money or having a legacy left to them so they can be involved in enjoying great luxuries. But God may supply you daily because He wants you to have something far better than money and gold. And that is a helpless dependence on Him that He may have the privilege of providing your needs day by day out of His unseen treasure. The Lord may let others be honored and put forward and keep you hid away in obscurity because He wants to produce some choice fragrant fruit for His coming glory, which can only be produced in the shade. God will let others be great but keep you small. He will let others do a work for Him and get the credit for it. But it make you work and toil on without knowing how much good you're doing. And then to make your work still more precious, He'll let others get the credit for the work which you have done, and this will make your reward at His judgment seat ten times greater. The Holy Spirit will put a strict watch on you if you'll submit to the high and holy and heavenly calling of God in Christ Jesus. He'll put a watch on you with a secret and jealous love. And He'll rebuke you for little words or feelings or for wasting your time. And some of you are so guilty which other Christians never seem distressed over. So make up your mind that God is an infinite sovereign. He has a right to do as He pleases with His own if you belong to Him. If you don't, you want to hitch Him up and hack Him out. God have mercy. This is a high and holy calling we got out here. And He'll not explain to you a thousand things which may puzzle your reason in His dealings with you. God will take you at your word if you'll let Him. And if you have to absolutely sell yourself to be a slave, he will wrap you up in a jealous love. He'll let other people say and do many things you cannot do or say. So settle it forever that you are to deal directly with the Holy Spirit and that He has the privilege of tying your tongue or chaining your hand or closing your eyes in ways that other, I might say boneheaded type of Christians are not dealt with. Now when you're so possessed with the living God in this personal, private, jealous guardianship and management of the Holy Spirit over your life, you will have found the vestibule to heaven. The greatest and the closest you'll ever get there in this lifetime. When you have this high and holy calling and submit to it in the fear of the Lord. All right, back to Abraham. Eliezer, the Holy Ghost, is looking, is found the bride now, and he's headed back home. He's headed back to where Abraham is. 
<laughs> Let me give you just a little bit of this. <clears throat> Verse 61, Genesis 24. Rebecca arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebecca and went his way. And Isaac, now he's going back home, and several days intervening. And Isaac came from the way of the well Laharoi, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at eventide. Sundown, he walked out in the field to meditate. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Boy, I read that. That woo, makes me want to shout. The bride and the bridegroom is just about united. We shall see the king. We shall see the king. We shall see the king when he comes. Hallelujah. The verse before that said, The bride united with the groom. We shall see the king when he comes. There's, here's Rebecca the bride, Isaac the son, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost leading that bride to be the bride of the Son of God. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. She literally fell off with excitement. She forgot to hold on <laughs> when she saw that master's son that she was going to be the bride of. Woo! And what caused her to do that? She said unto the servant, What man is this that walking in the field to meet us? And the servant, time of the Holy Ghost, said, it is my master. See, even Abraham's son was Eliezer's master. Therefore took she a veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all things that he'd done, how it all transpired to get that bride. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now he's comforted. He's finally united with that bride. The bride and groom has got together. Separation. Now, in closing, let me use a few New Testament scriptures. This will play them in the old. But some of the New Testament scriptures here that makes us understand how the Holy Ghost is dealing with us, purifying us, teaching us, Convicting us when we're wrong, comforting us when we're right, getting us ready to be in that bride is a big job. Now you don't know if you're blown to Abraham. Galatians the third chapter verse six. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now, verse thirteen. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. The blessing. When we get saved, we receive that birthright. But many people lose it. They don't consider it. They're like Esau. They despise their birthright because of the responsibility it casts upon us to walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. And that's written out here for us. Turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans and see it. Verse 12, the father of circumcision, that's Abraham, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. See, we're the children of Abraham if we walk in the steps of that faith he had in getting out from the idolaters. Some of you folks, you love the idolaters. That's where you want to head like a Martin who's going. I know that some in the video audience, you the same way. You'd rather be around a stinking idolater than you had around a saint. They condemn you, your stinking old stupidity, and your old lust of the flesh. 
I'd rather be a son of Abraham and have that birthright and that inheritance of blessing to go with it. I'm going to walk in the steps of that faith as much as I can find them. He left some big footprints in that sand. Praise God. And I look for those footprints. And separation is the only way you're going to find that path of Abraham into that blessing and birthright as you walk in the steps of that faith. He didn't walk by sight. Listen, it goes on here. Verse 18. <clears throat> well, verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be but grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Oh, that's a bold, profound statement. I love it. Verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope, that he might be the father of many nations? All right? Verse 19. And be not weak in faith, be not weak in faith. He had hope against hope, but he had faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Thirty-seven years later, his wife died. Forty years after this, here the promise was fulfilled in its completion. He had a successor. He had a son that had been had grown into maturity. That was walking in the steps of his father Abraham. Now he had the bride. He had all the provisions to get that seed that was going to bring Christ to the world. And through Abraham, every family of this earth could be blessed. If you ain't blessed, it's not God's fault. He gave us the fountainhead and all his descendants that walked in the steps of that faith. And I in the steps of that faith. You ain't going to have no excuse before that tribunal. But God's going to either say get on the right hand or on the left. You're going to have no excuse. I'm walking in the steps of that faith. And be not weak in faith when he was a hundred years old. He didn't doubt God. He staggered not in the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded what he promised he was able to perform Therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Praise God. We can walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. And we can have that blessing of Abraham. Lord, I can't go on. Time is short. Turn to Luke the 16th chapter. I want to show you here in closing here. We're going to give an altar call. Luke the 16th chapter. I want to show you something here. It's a warning from Jesus about being a son of Abraham like these Jews in John the 8th chapter said we're Abraham's seed we've never been bondage to any man why do you say we'll be made free see that's that scripture in the bottom Jesus quoted to them to them Jews you know the truth to make you free why do you say we'll be free we're Abraham's seed he said if you were Abraham's children you'd do the works of Abraham you'd live like Abraham you'd walk the steps of that faith Listen to what happened to one of Abraham's seed. It could happen to you or me. It ain't going to because I ain't going to let it. <clears throat> In the 16th chapter of the book of St. Luke, verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. That's what God called paradise. That was paradise before Jesus came and went down and preached to them when he was dead three days. And he brought captivity captive. And he, he took a host of them to heaven with him. Out of that paradise that was called Abraham's bosom. Down in the heart of the earth. See, that paradise was over on this side. And Sheol, or hell, was over on that other side. And them folks in hell could see paradise. But the folks in paradise couldn't see hell. God had a big gulf there in between them. And here it says, the angels carried the beggar that said at the rich man's gate and desired crumbs and wouldn't even give them to him. He died and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Most Americans live like a bunch of fools. They act like they want to go to hell. You warn them. 
And look at your little eyes all blurred. Go hard, hard, and sensitive. Like foot. What's there? Well, you'll find out. Like Paul Harvey said the other day on the broadcast, wasn't you telling about that rape? That he had an atheist friend died and he was kind of responsible for getting him buried and all. After he got him buried, he couldn't figure out what to put his epitaph on his tombstone. He thought about it for many days and finally went and got his stone cut out and put on there. I've gone to find out. So he put on that old atheist tombstone. I've gone to find out. That's what you're going to do one of these days. You don't walk in the steps of that faith of Abraham. You're going to go find out what this son of Abraham found out. Listen to him. In hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, here's one of them sons of Abraham that didn't walk in the steps of his father Abraham's faith. Yeah, you can be a son of Abraham and you can still go where this booger went. He says, Have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, see, he was one of Abraham's sons. That don't mean you're going where Abraham goes. Remember you in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's covered and you're tormented. And beside all this is a, between us and you, there's a great gulf fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, and they that would pass to us uh, cannot pass to us that would come from hence, where you are. Where you are, they can't come here. Where we are, we can't go there. Well, the son of Abraham lost in hell when he ought to have been over there in Abraham's bosom where Abraham's real children were. He recognized it. There was no more hope. So he says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come into this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They are Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let them hear the preacher in the Bible. Oh, he said, Nay, Father Abraham, they ain't going to listen to that brother preach out the Bible. They ain't going to hear that. He said, If one went from the dead, they will repent. They wouldn't know such a thing, but he thought they would. And Abraham said, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, if they won't hear the preacher preaching from the Bible, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. Now listen to what Abraham said unto him. He told him, he called him Father Abraham. Verse 25. Abraham said, Son, as a son of Abraham, equal to a son of God in his lifetime. Son. Remember, back when you was alive on earth, you had all the good things. You had things like you wanted. Lazarus had evil things. He laid the rich man your gate full of sores and wanted the crumbs. And the only respect he got was from the dogs. They licked his sores. And he sat there and laid there and starved with them. And now he's comforted. He's over there with his father Abraham. But you're not over here with, your, with Father Abraham. You're tormented. Woo! He said, Father, please get him to send him back to my father's house. Testify to my five brethren. They're fools just like I've been. They'll repent. They'll confess their sins. They'll repent of their sins. They'll turn to God if you'll send Lazarus over there and tell him that he saw me down here burning. Lest they come to this terrible place. And Abraham said, Son, if they won't believe Moses, that's the words of Moses and the prophets. The words of the prophets. They wouldn't believe Lazarus if he went back from the dead. That's startling. But it's true. It's true. Let's pray. Father, 
We've been called to a high and holy and heavenly calling. And we must separate ourselves from this world and its fashions, its pride, its lust, its entertainments, and all that goes with it. You called us to be blessed through Abraham's seed, Isaac, Jacob, David, Jesus, and right down here to this present hour, July 6, 19 and 97. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll touch every heart here today that they have repented. They're like that rich man. They, they go down and be tormented into that in the flames of hell if they had a wreck, was killed, or they dropped dead. Woo! God have mercy today. Help people, Lord, not to be foolish. For why should they die before their time? Lord, help them to think about it. The great, wonderful possibilities and rewards of being Abraham's son, to walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Separate themselves from the world. The first separation comes when we walk away from everybody and get on our knees before Jesus and say, Lord, by the Holy Ghost, come into my heart and I'll receive you as my Lord and Master and servant. God save from sin and hell. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.